quarter in May. Um, but I also had a successful assessment centre with um, McFarlane's. So a little bit about my application kind of journey to date. I applied to six firms. I had three assessment centres and then I had offers from all three. Um, but I had to decline one due to dates, which was a very fortunate position to be in. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's a bit about me and what my law stuff is at the moment. Um, that like before I even start that's just like incredible and I think I tell you this every single time <laughs> how good it is I actually can't imagine being in a position where I was able to reject a firm so well done um, I'm Danielle um, a lot of you may know me from LATC um, so I am a future trainee solicitor at Slaughter and May to start in 2022 and um, yeah, so we, I just thought we would do a workshop because I know that I struggled a lot with a lot of the key elements of an assessment centre because assessment centres tend to be a lot more than just an interview. Um, so that's a bit about me. I run LATC, just finished my graduate, my undergraduate degree at the University of Liverpool and I'm moving to London soon when the pandemic's a bit better. Right, so my name is Anushka, um, I am a second year law student, I got two, I got two interview offers, I, one at Slaughter's and one at another UK law firm. Um, yeah, so I accepted my Slaughter's interview, I wasn't able to accept the, the second one due to personal reasons, and I am an international law student, so yeah, that's pretty much about me. So I guess we'll kick off what happens actually at the start of an assessment centre. Um, I think this is something that's really important and isn't spoken about enough. Um, kind of as soon as you walk into a law firm, you are on show and you're being judged straight away. And it's horrible to say, but you really are as soon as you walk through the door. Um, so it's really important that in the non-assessed time that you're still impressing people and, you know, graduate recruitment are always watching. Um, so you need to make sure that you're like being the best person you can be during that time as well. Um, so it goes without saying, just be polite and friendly to everyone, whether that's, you know, the receptionists, the people taking your coat and suitcase, if you have them, your interviewers, just be really friendly and always introduce yourself um, to people. So, you know, even to the receptionist, if when you walk over, over to them, don't ask, um, don't wait for them to say, oh, who are you? Why are you here? Just walk over and be like, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Lucy. I'm here for this interview. Um, and you start off on a really good foot if you can kind of present yourself and introduce yourself confidently. Um, I think also help yourself to the food and drink that's out there and offered to you. So, um, for example, when I went to Clifford Chance, we were put into a room, there were five of us. And in the middle of the table, there was like the most amazing hamper of like naked bars and fruit and cookies and, you know, all sorts. And there's obviously tea and coffee and water in every room. And at first everyone was so cautious to take any because you're all sat around the table like, oh, you're going to be the first person to like take a, a banana. Like it, it becomes like some kind of weird, huge thing. But like actually just make yourself comfortable and just help yourself to what's being offered to you. You know, grad recruitment was actually really encouraging us to take stuff. And you may not be hungry, but just take something and put it in your bag for later. Like I'm pretty sure I took a cookie and just like ate it like in the train on the way home and it was actually really good as well so <laughs> definitely take it and always have a glass of water in your interview because it when somebody offers you something you just say no straight away it, it always creates this kind of weird tension like just say yes just have a glass of water even if you're not thirsty just like have it there um and just also just be engaged with everything that's going on in the firm if people are talking if you're being approached just don't don't sit down and like look at your phone the whole time stay stay engaged and if you don't know what to do there are often i found so when i went to my slaughter in may interview um there were a couple of papers on the table and i was the only person being interviewed at that time so i was like sat in reception on my own it was like 9 a.m um, obviously there was no one I could talk to or anything so I just read the paper like it just looks better than looking at your phone um, so yeah just be engaged with kind of what's going on in your surroundings 
I think that's such a good point, especially about the newspapers. I think in every single interview that I went to, there were always some papers there to read and they're generally sort of financial papers. But what was really interesting is the topics that I'd been studying for the commercial awareness questions actually were on the front page of the paper that day. So it meant that when I was going into the partner interview, as well as talking about what I'd already known, I was able to say, oh, and when I was outside, you know, I read the paper and I've learned about this development. So, you know, it's always a really good idea to do that and just to sort of keep your mind sort of commercially focused by reading those papers. But also about the food, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> in my HR interview, uh, as we've spoken about before, um, you know, she was like, do you want do you want one of these chocolates? And I was like, oh, I was like really wanting some. And she was like, I'm going to have one. Do you want one of these chocolates? And I was like, yeah, 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 I do really want one of those chocolates. And then, you know, it was, um, yeah, I think it's just a case of like, don't be afraid to, like Lucy said, take something if you're offered it. Um, they're offering it to you for a reason, like just because they want you to have it. It's not a test um, in most cases anyway. <laughs> Right, so this one is, uh, I think so Lucy had mentioned that many of, uh, I mean, while Lucy was doing a Q&A, many of the students were asking about how to maintain confidence in managing nerves. Like, it is very difficult to manage your nerves while on the day of the interview, or maybe two days before the interview, or maybe even a week before the interview. So I divide into two sections. So this is some of the tips which I followed when I went for my interviews as well. So the first one in terms of maintaining confidence this, this is a very common one, but it is very important because maintaining eye contact and focusing on your breathing pattern. Because I found that in my first interview, I was breathing very rapidly, like very shallow breaths. And I think that wasn't good because your breathing pattern plays a very important role because it helps you be relaxed at the same time. And eye contact shows that you are very confident, yet relaxed. And no matter how stressful the situation gets or how much they keep on grilling you, it shows that you are able to stay relaxed and confident and answer their questions. And um, this one is very important because aim to connect with interviews, not to impress them. Because many often, like we are just so engrossed in trying to impress the interviewer rather than trying to connect with them. So focusing your energy on trying to build a rapport with the interviewer will show you are very engaged in the conversation and they will also help you sound less less um, monotonous and at the same time this impresses the interviewer as well so try to build a rapport with the interviewer first and then the impression will fall thereafter and before the interview i would say be kind to yourself and just you know talk to yourself because you have made it this far so i feel this one is very important because um these are very important as many times we freak out a day before the into the interview or a week before the interview as well but while you're freaking out, don't forget to talk to yourself because for instance, in my slaughters interview, I was freaking out very badly until the partner greeted me. And the first thing she told me, and I still remember it very well, is that you have reached this far that they have chosen your application among hundreds or thousands who applied and got rejected. So we see some kind of potential in you and you deserve to be in this moment right now. So remind yourself that you have reached this far and you deserve to be right there and finally in terms of managing nerves i'm not very good at this but this one method really helped me very much it's called the stop method so the stop basically stands for so the s stands for stop basically interrupt your thoughts with the command saying like stop and pause whatever you're doing right now the t stands for take a breath like notice your breathing for a second, breathing slowly so that you, like you, you feel relaxed. And O stands for observe. So become the observer of your own thoughts and emotions. Like if you're feeling nervous, why are you feeling nervous? Or is the nervousness currently helping you in your current circumstance? For example, sitting in an interview or is that nervousness really helping you? And P stands for proceed. That is mindfully consider how you like to respond or what's one thing you can focus on right now or what is the most important priority. And so try to narrow down your priorities. This one really helped me because even I was really, really panicking in my slaughters interview as well, but your breathing pattern and your thoughts, like you need to learn to control them because a day or probably on the day of the interview, your thoughts are just all over the place. And 
Yeah, I definitely agree with those. I would also say for me, like managing my nerves before, I'd always make sure I was like outside the firm at least half an hour before my interview. And I just sit in a coffee shop and like stare at the firm until like I needed to go in basically. Um, and that really helped me because I knew I was right around the corner. So I was like, okay, well, I'm definitely not going to be late because I'm like two footsteps away from the door right now. I think that's a really good tip too. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I'd always, if I hadn't really been to the office much before, I'd find the office first and then look for a coffee shop afterwards that was nearby so that I knew that no matter what happened, I wasn't going to get super lost. Even if my internet stopped working and I couldn't use maps, I knew where it was. Um, so absolutely recommend doing that. Okay, written exercises, um, which uh, I think I was probably the most worried about for um, my assessment days, but they like weren't actually that bad. So um, I was exposed to a like broad variety of written exercises, but I'm going to talk mainly about legislation and maths. Um, so with legislation, I uh, my top tip would just be to like write all over it. The firms are literally just going to chuck it in the bin or hopefully the recycling um, when the assessment day is over. Um, so literally grab a pen and scribble all over it because not like you'll be given probably three pages of like an act, um, but not all of it will be relevant. So just scribble on it, like highlight the relevant areas to you. Um, and you normally will get given a pen and a highlighter. Um, but like if you don't, maybe just like bring them with you anyway, just to use. Um, and I would say this is probably the one differentiation between being a law student and a non-law student going to an assessment centre. As a law student, you'll have been exposed to how legislation works a lot um, before going to these things. As a non-law student, you may not have been. Um, so if you were non-law, I'd really recommend just having a read through um, like the Companies Act or, you know, just some piece of statute. So you're familiar with how they work and where you jump clauses to certain different areas and stuff. Just get familiar with the terminology, I think, because you're not going to have that long to digest it in the interview. So the more you know what to expect, the better in this situation. Um, and also, yeah, I've put down here, consider the meaning because like I said, you will get a lot of clauses that aren't that relevant, but because you need certain ones that come after it, you'll be giving them anyway. So think about why they've given you that piece of legislation and what you're actually trying to apply it to, because I think that's really important to make sure that when you scan through it, you're picking out the important bits and discarding like the non-relevant parts, really. Um, with maths, this was the area that I panicked about the most because I want to be a lawyer, not an accountant. I do English, not maths. Um, and I'm pretty sure every lawyer would say the same. We're, we're lawyers <laughs> because we can't do maths, essentially. Yeah. Um, so I would say for me, what really helped was to use a table. So it's like break the numbers down into like really small parts. Um, on my McFarland's assessment center, we were actually given a table to put the sums into anyway. So kind of if they give you a method of working out, like try and use it because they are trying to help you there. Um, I would say beforehand, just literally practice the basics, like make sure you can like do like multiplication and division like on the spot without using a calculator just to speed up the whole process. Um, uh, but I would actually say you probably won't use it, but bring a calculator with you. It might just make you feel better. So I remember when I was going to my McFarlane's assessment centre and I knew I had a maths task to do. I really panicked on my way because I was like, oh, my gosh, I, I need a calculator. Like, I'm probably going to need a calculator. So I bought one like that was ridiculously expensive in the train station just because I really panicked about it. So just like bring a cheap one from home with you on the day, it might just make you feel better. And then if other people have got calculators with them, like just use it. They're not going to tell you you can't. So that would be my tips tackling those two. So uh, great tips, Lucy. Um, with the business exercises, it's a slightly different um, process because obviously with like the legislation and maths, it's um, sort of, I, I assume it's more sort of short form answers, whereas business exercises is very much you have to write quite a lengthy, well, not necessarily, but it's, it's like paragraphed writing. Um, so the first thing that I would suggest is that in a lot of these business exercises is you're going to get a lot of information. So I had sort of six to seven pages of information, which sounds like a lot um, in sort of a, a, an hour to read, digest and write. But actually, um, the information is not that difficult to process. You know, if you've been reading like the Financial Times, it's nothing like that. It's a lot easier than that. Um, they're not going to give you something that's really hard to digest in such a short period of time. 
So the first thing that I did was I would read the um, information the first time, not writing anything down. And then I'd reread it again a second time whilst making annotations. So this meant that the second time I read it, I was picking up things that I perhaps didn't really um, pick up on the first time, or I was starting to understand things that were quite complex because I was reading over it again. So that's the number one thing. Um, secondly, plan. Don't just go straight into writing it. I think that, you know, in a situation like this where you've not been able to do like mocks or practices before, people can just sort of get really put off by the time pressure. And so they can just go straight into writing it and then they don't really know where they're going because whilst they've done some annotations, you know, they don't have a coherent plan or structure. So I definitely, um, would recommend doing quite a detailed plan well not a hugely detailed plan but sort of bullet points to get all of your key points in there um some of them will suggest a structure but for me if it's an evaluation type exercise i would really recommend using the swot technique um, and also when you're evaluating business decisions use the porter's five forces that's the that's the kind of stuff that i went off and prepared um before i went into the um, assessment so it when I went in I kind of had it in my head how I was going to approach it anyway um, that's always quite a good way to prepare for a any sort of business exercise um, so before the day understand sort of the key elements of business decisions so you know you've got to think what are the reasons for a company merging what are the pros to um, a company acquiring another company what are the pros to diversifying you know, there's, there's typical business decisions, so just think about them, um, you know, and if you read the FT and Economist, you, you should pick up on things like that. Um, but also, yeah, just think pros and cons whenever you're reading any sort of M&A article or finance article um, or anything where a business just sort of takes a different direction. And you can always refer to that in your answer. Um, also, um, in regards, I haven't actually written this down, but try and feed commercial awareness into it. So. For my business um, proposal, uh, the company had previously suffered in the property bubble um, in 2008, but it didn't actually say it was to do with the housing crisis. So you've got to think, why have they struggled, you know? And you've, if you have an awareness of what went on in the global financial crisis and just big events like that, then that's going to be really important because you can say, you know, well, if they may have struggled here, it's probably because of this reason, because this was what was going on. So they actually might not struggle doing the same thing now. So um, that's always a really good thing. And also, if you've been reading things that sort of may interlink or um, may back up your decisions, um, that are like a commercial awareness topic, then definitely bring them in because any opportunity to show that you're commercially aware is going to be great. Um, in terms of the structure, uh, so I actually spoke to a trainee um, before I went into my assessment centre and he said the best thing that you can do is to write an executive summary at the beginning. So just kind of talk about the decision that you've made um, and, and then in your main body, then sort of discuss why you've made that decision. Just so as soon as the marker is reading it, they know that you've made a decision because that's really the most important part. Um, and yeah, and I always recommend sort of writing a conclusion statement. Um, and then obviously at the end, spend five minutes doing spelling grammar check. That's really, really important. Okay. <laughs> um, so news article exercises. I think all of us three did the news article exercises at Sorters, didn't we? Um, I was actually so scared for this because I went to a workshop at Mayor Brown and they gave me this really, really difficult article. And I went to a workshop at Allen and Overy and they gave me an article about like eating, um, like people starting to eat bugs as a nutritional source. So I had these horrible things in my head, like, oh no, I'm going to have something really quite difficult. But I think um, they'll always give you an opinion piece at an interview. Um, which I think makes it a bit easier just to sort of um, understand because I feel like with opinion pieces they have to outline their um, what, what's going on and then further outline um, their beliefs on it so um, don't worry too much uh, my article came from the Guardian so I was actually quite worried that it was going to come from like the FT and it was going to be quite difficult and I wouldn't have time to sort of like piece my thoughts together but actually um, it you know it wasn't it wasn't the worst art it was it's was actually a really nice article um so i would really recommend to prepare for these reading 
um, the tough articles. So read the FT, read The Economist, which is a bit more accessible than the FT, read BBC Business. If you read everything, then you're going to come across like really tough articles. <laughs> so that means that when you get into your interview, it it's not going to be worse than that. It might be as bad as those tough articles or it might be better than those tough articles. So, um, yeah, I definitely recommend sort of having a go at the FT first. Um, well, before you get into the um, actual assessment. Um, I thought that really, really did help me. And when you're reading these articles, don't just read them. I feel like lots of people waste time just by reading articles and not doing anything with that knowledge. But act as if you're in the assessment centre. Act as if you've got to go into a partner interview and discuss it and, you know, sort of note down. So what I would do is I would highlight any key terms I didn't know. And then after I'd read the article, I would go and Google those key terms and then annotate the article. And I'd say, this is what this means. And then I'd talk to my friends about it or explain like a key concept, like what an IPO was or what an angel investor was. And that was, that ended up actually being really helpful. So if you have got friends who are also wanting to go into a commercial law career, it's always great to discuss these kind of news business issues with them and key terms because I feel like when I say things like it goes into my head a lot better than if I just read it I don't know if it's the same for you guys but a conversation always sort of like drills the information in um always think about the risks so look at look at the motivations for why a company is doing something why a company is moving or expanding in that direction why are they doing it what's the future of that market but what are the risks equally and that's something that you could get asked so, um, you know, you just want to think of sort of the wider scale, the wider picture, but you need to be questioning yourself these things before you get in so that when you're reading this article in that 15 minute period or whatever it is, you are doing the same, asking those, yourself those same questions so that when the interviewers ask you, you've already thought them through. Um, always be able to relate it back to a firm. I think that's a really common sort of question that, um, that the partners will ask you when you're in these interviews. You know, they'll say, OK, so say if this was one of our clients, how would we get involved? So have an understanding of the different practice areas and where they would get involved. So if it's an M&A deal, yes, the M&A team may be the core team. But then also, is there real estate involved? There'll be tax implications there. There'll be employment issues, probably. So, um, I mean, if it's a business, they're going to have employees. So, you know, you've just got to think about the wider scale and then, you know, if it's a, a share sale, for example, they're probably going to, well, they're going to have all these liabilities because um, they're going to, the liabilities pass um, with the business. So then you've got to think, are there any potential litigation issues? What, what, what's going on with their business, with their clients? Have they got any issues? So there are lots of opportunities for law firms to get involved. And it's always really, really good if you can link that back and show an awareness how a lawyer um, would have a role to play in this um, news story. And obviously opportunities goes back to thinking about the wider market and what's going on. Um, but also any opportunity that they have to maximise a profit is really good to discuss as well. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, terms that commonly crop up in these interview articles are things like hedge funds, private equity, angel investors, what a derivative is, equity versus debt finance, uh, initial public offering and capital markets. Um, that's if you get a finance article, you might actually not get a finance article. But um, the way that I learned a lot of these terms was from reading books like um, How the City Works by Philip Coggan. Uh, that was really, really good, especially with uh, the term derivative. I always really, really struggled um, to quite grasp what a derivative was. And then I read that book and it made a lot more sense. Um, and don't worry, <laughs> there, are, there are some lawyers that don't know what a derivative is. So if you struggle with it, it's OK to sort of tell them what you what you inter what you think it to mean and what you've read it to mean but if you struggle with some of the terms you can always ask them for clarification yeah I would I would agree with all of those I would also say the slaughters article and yeah I was given one opinion for this from the guardian but I'm just going to caveat that with my Clifford Chance experience where I was given about 100 pages of Financial Times articles um, and 15 minutes to go through it so that wasn't straightforward um but i think picking out key terms like the terms that um danielle's put on here are really really important and if you can spot those in the articles and read the couple of sentences around them it normally helps you get through it pretty quickly and you can get quite a good idea of what the article is about um 
And yes, yeah, so I would say definitely familiarize yourself with the Financial Times because if you can crack that, then everything else will be better. And like, if you if you get what, what I started doing, I think is I'd read an article in the Financial Times, not really understand it, look at the same article in the BBC, understand it a little bit more, and then come back to the Financial Times. And I think just doing that kind of makes it a little bit easier. Okay, so group exercises, which I feel like is an area that a lot of people talk and panic about. Um, but yeah, firstly, don't panic. I actually really enjoyed my group exercises. It was so much more straightforward than I ever thought it was going to be. Um, so for my group exercise, I was put into a room with five others and a senior associate and associate, and we were given um, like a negotiation task. So we were split into two groups of three. Um, and it was all about um, airlines and but, uh, my whole, all my case studies basically this year were about Thomas Cook or like kind of related, not directly, but they wanted you to have an understanding of that story because it was the main um, thing that was going on at the time. Um, and it was actually really straightforward. So I know people say like, you know, don't, but don't be the loud one, but also like, don't be really quiet. Like maybe try and be the timekeeper. And I think it's very easy to kind of overthink your role in a group exercise. Literally just be a team player, just talk to people, make sure you're talking make sure other people are talking. And when you're in a small group, like it will be quite straightforward. I think, you know, when people say, don't be the leader or don't be the quiet one, you envisage groups of like 20 people, but you will never be like in a group of 20 negotiating against another group of 20 that just won't happen because the firm can't assess you properly you will be in a tiny group so it's actually pretty easy just to have a conversation all together um, and you've got to remember as well you know everyone is trying to do well like everyone wants each other to do well as well it's quite a supportive environment no one's competing against one another like everyone's just like trying to do well and work together um, and I also think it's important to remember there is no right or wrong answer like so the associate who was like marking us wasn't even listening to what well, he wasn't listening directly to our conversations anyway um, and when we did the negotiation he wasn't even like listening really um, to what what we were actually negotiating about he was just trying to listen to how we came across what points we were making how we were all working together and then at the end he was like oh so what was your conclusion and we told him and he was like oh okay interesting and like that was it like they're not he, he didn't say oh no like you did this wrong like there is no right or wrong answer for that um so don't worry about that too much um yeah i, I just put keep an eye open of how much people are contributing just you know make sure everyone's talking if, if there is one person who genuinely hasn't said anything just be that person that says oh what's your opinion just just ask the question i think and be a nice person um and definitely watch the clock i think i wish i'd looked at it more during my negotiation because we we had about six bullet points that we had to like decide on and we got to the last two which we deemed as our like least important ones but it meant we had to really really rush through them um so i would just recommend just like making sure that you're spending a good amount of time on each like topic or bullet point you have to cover um and yeah like i said they're really not that scary i actually thought it was quite fun so <laughs> don't worry about it too much also, those people may be your future colleagues, so you want to work really well with them because if you're on your training contract and you're both in the same seat working on a project together and you've already worked together in an assessment centre, that's going to be really good for building up that relationship later on. Right, so situational questions. Um, I think so many times in tweets you do get asked like at least one or two situational questions. So. I think before you like even like start preparing for it, it's really key to highlight that, understand what the interviewer is looking for in your response, because it is very important to highlight or mention the key skills which you demonstrate in each situation. So for instance, in my interview, uh, I got asked a similar question, like describe a situation where you had work under a tight deadline. And I drew upon my personal experience that it's a part-time job. So it could be a part-time job, it could be working in a society, or it could be working for a presentation, like anything, teamwork, anything. So try to weave a story first. So the so for example, in this question, like describe a situation where you had to work on a tight deadline. The main skills to highlight would be like time management, organization, or ability to work under pressure. So it's important to create a picture in the interviewer's mind 
So focusing on one particular experience or situation and and then expand on that skill you gain from it. Because what I've seen is like uh, many times like people try to put in like too much information for like just for one question. So try to focus it. So try to focus or like narrow it down to just one experience. So it could be your part time job, like a time where you found difficult to handle your part time job, your extracurricular activities, and your uni and any uni work. So focus on maximum like two to three skills per situational questions because at the end it's about the quality and not the quantity of information you're putting in. And always try to link the skills you mentioned with the skills that the particular law firm is looking for. Because I think many times we forget about the skills that the law firm is looking for in the candidates and we just say some skill which is completely which is completely like out of topic to the question. Because um, the better you can articulate a relevant example of when you use a unique skill or demonstrate like a positive character trait, the more you build evidence for the interviewer to make a ground assessment. So, yeah. I also think just adding on to that one, be prepared to like justify um, how you acted and reacted because in one of my interviews, I was asked um, what, like a, to te describe a time where I like, had like had a conflict with someone in the team and like how we resolved it or what the end result was and my interviewer just because she just wanted to have a bit of fun um was like oh well no like I wouldn't have done that like I actually agree with the other side because of xyz and I was there like well okay but that's not what I just told you like this is my decision um and like we have to keep going back and forth but I had to like really justify like every single tiny decision that I made so just like be prepared that you can um, like literally cr create the whole picture and describe like everything that happened in that situation. I think it's really important. Ooh. So um, this is so going how to answer those kinds of questions. The best structure is the star structure, but there's an extra R on the end, which I really recommend doing, um, which I'll discuss on the following slide after this one. So. Um, the first thing that we'll go through is situation, task and action. So with situation, you've got to give an overview of the situation to provide them some context so they understand what's going on, where it was, when it was, uh, if you were in a team, if you were alone, kind of just the overall picture. Um, so for me, I've given an example which I've actually used in a successful interview. Um, so I was on the Law Society Committee as negotiations chairperson. It was my role to do this. Um, and then the task comes next. Um, so what was the task that had to be completed? Now this can be the whole task of the group um, or this can be your task, um, but I like to give over, give the whole overview of what task it was. And then when I go into action, I talk about what I specifically did. So the task that we had to do as a team was we had to secure a venue for the grand finals. Um, we had a budget and the venue that we'd looked at was a bit over budget. So the action that I took personally um, was to research into finding out if we had connections with them and then using that leverage to secure a better deal. So that was what I did personally. So whilst the task was a group task, the action that I took personally is something that you need to hone in on so not just what the group did I feel like that's a really really easy falling down point if you're talking about a, a, a group task is that they'll just say we did this we did this but the law firm doesn't want to know what these other people did alongside you they want to know what you did specifically to stand out um, and what the action that you took did to help that overall task be successful so they're the they're the first three if we could go on to it so then obviously there's a result, which is what everybody will know about. So what was the result of the action? So we managed to secure this venue for a discounted deal. But the extra bit at the end, which I always recommend adding, is reflection. So I think lots of people talk about star, but kind of stop after results. But I think reflection is really important because, you know, is there anything that you would have done differently uh, if you were going to do it again next time? Is there anything that you did really well that you'd incorporate again? And I think it's really important to acknowledge that perhaps you know that although there was a good result you would have got a better or a more efficient result if you've done something slightly differently and if you can say that and if you can admit that you know whilst it was okay you would do something differently next time that shows so much self-awareness which is obviously a key skill that law firms are looking for so it's really good to have this sort of like 
basic structure in place um, when you go into these interviews because it's really going to help you when you're asked those questions because you kind of know what to do in your head you know you do this that that so then you can give really con a really clear concise well but equally well detailed answer where you're also showing that you're self-aware and um, so that was I, I really enjoyed answering those questions once I cracked this structure so um, that they are that is the structure that I would suggest and then on the next slide we just have some examples of the types of questions that commonly come up in interview. I know that personally I've had a uh, tummy time about when you work in a team quite a few times. Um, and also the setback one is also, uh, and resilient kind of goes hand in hand. Um, if you can think of an, uh, an example for each of these when you go into your interview, then most times, um, the questions will be like reworded variants of these because these are like super super common so if you go in just knowing an example of each for each of these and that's we're gonna make you a lot more confident when you're approaching the questions okay so motivation questions these are the kind of questions that you are guaranteed to get asked like i i don't know an assessment center when you where you like wouldn't get asked any of these questions um so these are the ones that the firm's really looking for to make sure that you are motivated to be a lawyer and that you are motivated to work for them um, which is obviously so 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 important when you're trying to impress a recruiter um, so why law you could also get asked why commercial law um, they're pretty similar i would say if you get asked why law and then they ask you the commercial part you probably haven't covered why law in enough detail yeah. for them they're just trying to kind of encourage you to say a little bit more um, and I think with these questions, I've heard people give examples before and they're like, well, I like this, this, this and this. So I want to do this to work. And that's just not really going to get you very far. I think it's really important that you take your interview like on a journey. Like there are going to be certain points in your life that have made you think, OK, I've enjoyed this. And then I did this and I really enjoyed this aspect. And then I did this and I got work experience here. And all this combined is why I want to be a lawyer. Um, so it's really important. Like, I feel like, you know, don't give the cheesy answer like, I woke up when I was seven years old and I just knew I wanted to be a solicitor. Um, like you might have done, like I, I have literally wanted to be a lawyer since like I was tiny. I, I don't know why, I've just always wanted to be one. Um, but you can't say that in an interview, like you've got to justify your journey there. So like, did you think you wanted to be one and then did you like go and do some work experience and like what did you enjoy about it? Um, have you explored any other careers? So like I knew I explored a career in marketing, um, but like, decided not to do it and I speak about that in an interview I say well I nearly did a marketing degree but I chose to do law for xyz and just like show them that you've actually really really thought about what law means to you why the firm as well I think this is an obvious question that you're going to get asked um, there must have been a reason why you applied to the firm in the first place so be prepared to justify it and you know really think about why you're actually there and how you can convince them why you want to be there um, so if you've met them before, like definitely talk about that. I think the three firms I actually had interviews with, I'd all met them at, whether that was like a Bright Network event um, or, you know, if they'd come onto campus or if I'd been to a webinar with them, they're all experiences where I could say, oh, I talked to this person, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and then, you know, I looked into this further. Um, so kind of just like literally lay out exactly why you're applying and why you want the job there. And I think, thinking about whether your values align with the firm is also really important for this like a lot of firms do similar work but a lot of firms have very different values so that's the usp of the firm it's the value not the work commercial law is commercial law but like the firms are di intrinsically different in like the people and the way they work so finding that usp and being able to relate your experiences to why that value is important to you is really really important and I think will give like a really good like justification to why the firm um, also be able to answer the like question like why solicitor or why barrister because I feel like if you can talk about why law and you can talk, talk about why a law firm they're going to know particularly why you're not going to the bar if you're like interested in law um, so if you had some if you've had some bar experience great like that's brilliant I actually hadn't um, but I knew I liked working in a team um, and I knew I preferred the like solicitor aspects of the law more than the barrister aspect. You know, I wanted to be more client focused and stuff like that. So just understand how the two roles are different and why you've chosen one over the other. 
also with just building on from that question you will probably get this question if you do any mooting activities yeah. so i did mooting extracurricular in first year and they said to me you know you've done muting you went to a university dinner at lincoln's inn why why do you want to be a sister why not a barrister and it's the same as you i said you know i really want to work in a team um, and also for me i didn't really want to work on um a disputes or things like that I wanted to do sort of the transactional side of things a lot more I mean obviously I'm still really open to my for going on a dispute seat and I think it'd be really interesting but from the the differences in roles I don't really like advocacy that much I didn't really want to oh, I'm, I'm happy to work alone on my own task but if it's a part of a, a bigger picture that everybody else is working on um, and I think that's really important and I think that's a really common question if you do have any extracurricular which sort of suggests the bar but the two careers are so so different and I don't think I realized that when I was in sort of first year um, but they are so different so it is quite easy to say why one over the other just because the they're just different you know when you think law lots of people think you know advocacy courtroom um, or crime or things like that but actually a commercial solicitor is very very different in fact a commercial solicitor is a very very different role to a high street solicitor so just understanding a lot more about the actual career will help you so much because you'll be able to say well i want to do this 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 and this is what i do as a commercial solicitor but i don't get that as a barrister so um yeah just have an awareness of what commercial solicitors actually do regularly Right, so strengths and weakness question. So I feel like these get quite fairly asked like a few of them in interviews as well. So in both of them, what I feel common is that you need to focus on at least three to four of your weakness and strengths. So in the strengths, it could be that you might be a really good team player. If you like, for example, if you are, I mean, if you have a part-time job or if you work in, or if you work in a society, then you, you you can you can see you can be like that one of your strengths is that you're, you're a very good team player or you work well under pressure or you're good at time management like juggling part-time job your extra public activities and university so in terms of strengths um draw upon situations or experience again where you have used these view a story and explain how you have used your strengths to achieve something so i would say the goal of here would be to go like a place from which was not so good to a place which was like better because you were able to use your strengths over there and achieve something better out of it. Even for weaknesses, I think like all, I mean, I feel like we, I mean, employers expect candidates to have some kind of weaknesses. So you're better served by the answering the question, frankly. A candid answer will show your prospective employer, your growth mindset, and will also demonstrate a sense of like self-awareness and honesty. So again, for weakness, I would say focus on three to four of your weaknesses, because usually we all have like at least one or two weaknesses. Draw upon situations of weaknesses where you have experienced them and weave a story again as the strengths. But what is the most important part about weaknesses is that what did you do to overcome it or, or what do you continue to do to overcome it? This is the most important part because it shows that you are very keen on overcoming your weaknesses and you're still working on it. That's the most important part of the question. And be careful not to give an example, which will sort of a red flag in the interviewer's mind, because the aim should be, again, is to go from zero to hero, which is like a place which was not so good with your weaknesses. But then now, because you're using methods to overcome it, you are in a better place than you were before. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, I, I think especially the point you made, be careful not to give an example that set off a red flag to the interviewer. Perfect, because honestly, I feel like, there's a huge huge line between saying something that is awful like the well, not awful but saying something that isn't a good example like I'm a perfectionist because they're just going to see that and go that's not a real weakness versus saying I'm lazy now if you say oh my weakness is that I'm lazy then that's going to be one of those red flags for, <laughs> for lawyers so just find an example that's that's genuine um I know for me I um sometimes get quite bad anxiety so that was my weakness so to overcome that what I would do is I joined the committee of the law society I did a 
lectures to students once a month to 100 students so that I get over that sort of initial public speaking anxiety and I'd learn to speak to lawyers at organising our networking events and things like that so being proactive and doing things to try and be better and to improve that weakness is as Anushka rightly says the exact thing that you need to be showing. Okay, so who, who wants to talk first? This is a, <laughs> a collaborative one. I'm happy to go for the first one. Um, so in terms of commercial awareness questions, you, you won't be asked these like explicitly, but the important thing is with these questions is to weave commercial awareness in and show your broader understanding. Um, so what distinguishes us from our competitors is, is genuinely a question you could get asked and they might even pinpoint a competitor. Um, so in my interview at Clifford Chance, um, you know, she said like, why the firm? I gave my justification and she was like, well, you could have said that about Allen and Overy. So what, what differentiates us between, between A and O? And I was like, oh, okay, here we go. Um, so you have to really know like the firm inside and out and know exactly why they are unique in the legal market. Um, and if they haven't like picked out a competitor, name drop one, say, you know, I know this firm, like, so like BCLP and like Norton Rose Fulbright are pretty similar. Um, so, you know, name drop it and say why they're different from one another. Um, I think, I think it's the legal 500 or like Chambers 500 that shows um, different like bands. That both of them. Both of them. Okay. Yeah, the Chambers band. and Partners and Legal 500 both have rankings. Look at them if you're applying, like it's so important. Just have a look. <laughs> that's, that's a differentiating, differentiating feature if you can say, well, you're like band one for these practice areas above like this firm. That's really great if you can like remember that enough to mention it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that kind of feeds into thinking about like the strengths and weaknesses of the practice areas, like which ones are like higher than like one another. Um, it's, it's good to have an understanding of that. Um, and yeah, also like looking at the, I think the corporate responsibility of the firm does differentiate it a lot. Like you can tell when a firm's investing in certain pro bono projects or is doing certain innovative projects in certain areas. And that does tell a firm apart from one another and just how they structure and strategize, strategize the firm as a whole, like not just the specific work, but like how does the day-to-day -day running of the firm differentiate from someone else? Like is their international strategy different? So for example, Stoughton may take a best friends approach to international work. Um, not like many of the magic circle firms do that. So it's obviously very different to Clifford Chance that have, you know, 44 global offices. Um, so being able to spot out those niche differences definitely helps with your commercial awareness in that aspect. And they actually might, that might follow on as well from a question of, oh, who else have you applied to? Um, yeah. Now, that question might sound really quite scary because you don't want them to to think, oh, you know, you don't want them to think, oh, what if they think that I prefer them over, over you? But they, they just want to know. They want to know that you have some kind of logic for applying, that you understand the market, that you understand that different firms operate in different spheres. So if you apply to, I don't know, link laters, you don't have to just name drop the magic circle because you know linklaters have different specialisms to like freshfields and it's it's the same you know but for me i was looking at certain things to apply for so i was i was looking for project a good project finance team real estate team corporate and finance they were like my sort of areas i was really interested in um so i wouldn't go and apply to firms that would specialize in disputes if that makes sense so they want to see that you understand the market but then following on from that they'll say okay you've named our competitors good to see that you know you've you've thought about it and you're choosing firms with similar specialisms but then they'll say what differentiates us from them and that's when you sort of turn to either their client focus as Lisa said their international strategy their seat options things that are going to think both what's going to make you happier as a trainee and also what's going to stand out to clients you've got to think from both angles there um, but the second um, commercial awareness question that we're going through is tell us about something that's going to impact the legal market. So when I heard this question, I was actually quite worried because I thought that it was just sort of what's affecting lawyers, you know, like SQE, legal tech, anything else. But actually, if you think about it, anything that affects a law firm's clients and their profitability is going to affect a law firm because where the law firms get their money from their clients so if there's something that you know um like 
just taking coronavirus as an example, that's causing a massive depletion in real estate work and construction. And so, you know, that has an impact on a firm's real estate team because they may have less work to do. So um, just always remember that what affects a client affects a law firm. And if it's going to lead to, um, you know, work becoming quite you know stagnant and not moving, then that's worth talking about. Um, and also consider the work that the firm does, so like con co uh, contract alteration restructuring. So obviously in a, like a financial crisis, uh, areas like corporate and M&A may see a decline in work, but at the same time the restructuring department sees um, in, like, a, a lot more work. So this doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad for um, the firm, it just means that there's a shift in the work there and how the firms can respond to that challenge is actually really important to talk about. Um, but also things like new legislation. So obviously we had the GDPR and e-privacy was meant to come in at the same time as the GDPR and obviously um, maybe not now that we're Brexited, but um, that was actually you know, a big thing um, which affects law firms because law firms are also businesses and law firms also have to uh, comply obviously massively with all the con confidential information that they have to data protection regulations so looking at what's happening and applying that to the firm um, but also if you look at the libel to Sonia transition you know the 350 trillion dollars worth of derivatives are underpinned by libel that's a lot of uh, contract amendments that are going to have to be made by law firms and a lot of potential litigation. So that affects the legal market by affecting their clients. So if you think of it like that, it's not just limited to what's affecting the legal profession specifically, just sort of think in the long term. Um, but don't, you know, don't be cliche, think about something unique. I know that when legal tech and uh, all came out and AI, everybody was talking about it, but like everybody's spoken about that so much now. Unless you have an interesting point of view or perspective on it, I would advise not speaking about it. But if you do have an interesting point of view, do it. So I know that um, uh, everybody was told a few years ago, you know, don't speak about Brexit anymore, don't speak about it, because uh, everybody's been speaking about it. But then I spoke to somebody who, um, introduced me to Brexit in the context of MIFID 2 and that's applicability. And that's actually really interesting for um, people who work in finance and that's a big thing for them. So it's a slightly different angle on a generic topic, which is fine and actually can be really impressive. So just don't be cliche with the main points and just think of something that you're actually interested in because if you're interested in it, then you're gonna have a far better discussion with the interviewer and um you know if you know you know if the interviewer introduces themselves and says oh i'm a finance lawyer and one of the stories you've been reading about is finance story then speak about that you know it might be scary because they actually know what's going on it, it's not going to because they're not going to expect you to have such a high level knowledge of the ins and outs of this financial issue um but actually you'll have a nice back and forward discussion where you both get it so um i'd really recommend sort of looking at that if you can um, and always link it back to the firm, it, either talk about the research that you've done on the firm that relates to that story, or, you know, if you don't know something, feel free to ask them, you know, if there's a big issue going on that's affecting the legal market, you can say, you know, well, I've spoken to other firms, I know what they're doing, but what are you doing? I'm really curious to see how you're responding to this challenge. You can always say that back at them. So actually, when I was doing questions at the end of my interview, I said, you know, with Libel to Sonia, which I've mentioned again, because it was, it, was, it was really interesting in, in November particularly. I said, you know, I've spoken to your, one of your clients, Barclays, about how they're, um, you know, gonna deal with it. And I know that they're doing like a litigation, um, risk mitigation exercise, but what are you doing? How are you protecting your clients externally? And we actually had a really good conversation about that because he was a finance lawyer. So, but I'd also link that back to what the firm was doing. And I admitted that I didn't know because they weren't, you know, they weren't publishing it. But then I was able to find out and then we had a discussion about the firm's response. So, um, yeah, I'd really recommend just sort of trying to link it back at the end, even if you don't personally know anything yet, to link it back to you, just ask the question. I think also part of that link and part of like considering the work the firm does is thinking about who they're representing. So are they like 
representing employers or employees and like that differentiation is actually quite big like often the big corporates will be more on the employers because they have more money um regional more like employees but it's like consider that difference because it de all depends on like which side the firm is on in like certain negotiations and disputes really uh so curveball questions uh i think so these get asked in even few of the interviews i guess um so curveball question could be anything uh like for example um in one of my interviews i got asked uh how many yeah how many congestions sorry how many congestion zones does like london have and, and like how many people travel in and out during said hour you are not going to know the exact number of how many people are traveling in and out of london every single day it's just like so so when i got so when i got asked the question what i try to do is like um check a piece of paper because they will usually have like paper and some pen over there stationery take this stationery try to work something else so they know they that you're trying to build like the answer so tell them like so so the so so for example the london congestion zones have like x number of congestion zones and as, as far as I know, X amount of people go in and Y amount of people go out because some of them are students or some of them are like, you know, coming back home after holidays. So they know that you're trying to break the question down, even though the, even though the number is not like absolutely correct. But as far as like, as far as you're able to show them you're, that, that, you're, that, um, that you're able to like break down the question into like bits, they'll be like, it's fine. So yeah. And, um, if it's a long and detailed question, I would say uh, say I'm like write it down, like use the station which you which they give you, and don't be afraid to say if you don't understand or if you don't know, just ask them what they think about it. And um, this point is also very good. Like be logical. Like for example, I understand it as, or in my opinion, because you won't know the exact number of like, or you won't know like what's the exact answer. So try to start the answer with by saying that I, I, um, I. Sorry, I understand it as, or in my opinion, I ask if you can come back to the question later because my, because I think I think the worst case uh, scenario would be like you may not know the answer at all. So if you don't know, like just tell them like, can I please come back to the question later? So yeah. Yeah, I completely agree, and also um, I think it's really important to show how you're sort of working it out in your head. So um, one of the questions that I actually had that was the most difficult question I've ever had was I was in second year going in for a vacation scheme interview and they said to me, okay, so your client is a company who owns 20% uh, shares in a hotel. They want to buy the rest of the shares in the hotel, um, but there's a, two, it, there's a joint venture going on. What do you have to think about? How would you affect this acquisition? And my goodness, I was... I had no idea so I and I didn't realize at the time that they weren't asking me give me a legal opinion they were asking me to work it out in my head and come to a decent logical conclusion and one thing that I massively regret not doing was taking advantage of that notepad because I feel like if I'd have done that and said okay here's to here here's to here what would we do who would get involved it would make a lot more sense but I was terrified because this was like my first ever interview that I did and biggest mistake ever so if it is a long question write it down if it's a short question or a question that doesn't involve much thought I wouldn't recommend writing it down but if you need to note down facts or you know you know like in Anushka's case you know she had to work out sort of how many people were coming in and out that's the time to get your pen out if you've got or if you've got a long question but you know if they just asked you like a question that you kind of stumble a bit I wouldn't recommend getting the pen and paper out if it's quite short and you could work it out um but um but yeah I mean always have a glass of water except what I would recommend doing is making sure that your glass of water is actually filled up because when I was in said interview and they gave me that question I had already drank like now my glass of water and so I went to drink out of it and there was nothing in it and I was just here and they were looking at me like what, what is she doing <laughs> she's drinking out of an empty glass so um always make sure that you leave enough water for the whole interview and don't just drink it all straight away um <laughs> so that is a because that's not a very good way to take some time before a question um unless you actually have water in it um but yeah and also you know don't be afraid to say sorry could you repeat that or could you explain it in a slightly different way and and but don't just ask them to do the whole question if you say 
okay I'm stuck with this particular part of the question like I kind of get the rest of it but what what exactly do you mean by this um that's always a, a lot better than just if they've said a huge question you go sorry can you repeat and then they have to try and think again of the exact question that they'd ask um so that's my my, my tips so just general interview techniques I think it's really important to just be yourself and be friendly. I think smiling goes a really, really long way. And like, don't be, I hate the word banter, but like, don't be afraid to like, have like a little joke with your interviewer and have like a genuine chat. So like my first interview, which was my first ever interview actually at Slaughter's, I was literally in the middle of my exam week. So I had done an exam one day and then I had a morning exam. Then I got on the train to London, did my Slaughter's interview like the next day came back to Exeter and sat in an exam the following day. So it was like a stressful period of my time. So when the interview was like, oh, how are you? Like, how's your week been? I was like, oh, to be honest, it's been pretty stressful. Like I'm currently in exam season. And then like at the whole interview, he was always like, oh, you could mention that in this exam. And I was like, haha, very funny. Um, but like, he, like, just be a person. And I think, you know, like a smile and a laugh goes a long way because at the end of the day, partners may seem really scary and I remember as soon as like my partner like came to get me I was absolutely terrified I was like oh my gosh this guy is like so powerful um but like he's just a person at the end of the day like he commutes in and out of the office like he was a trainee once like he's been interviewed once just like yeah listen and look engaged to the person um I think I'll stop there and let someone else carry on the rest of the bullet points absolutely I mean I also had a bit of banter in my um in my interview you know and we were just it was just like little comments like this that were really light-hearted and actually made me feel so comfortable because I feel like when you're in a professional environment you, you know obviously you have to be like super professional at all times but at the same time you want to show your personality and you want to show you're able to have a, a little laugh every so often and so that was you know a that was a big thing for me to go this is the firm for me and also they don't want somebody who is going to be like really sort of personalityless in the office like these are people that they have to work with on a daily basis they want people with personalities they want people who can feel like they can be who they are in the office and not just put on a facade and so you know literally it sounds cliche but be yourself and if it's appropriate to have a joke it's not always it it's not always appropriate to crack a joke but if it is do it because you know that's who you are and um you don't want to have to sort of squash yourself down because you don't feel comfortable there i think adding on to that i think so like um like when preparing for interviews like we forget many times that at the end of the day it's just a conversation like you're going i mean yeah i mean it is a professional setting but you have reached as far you're just going to go into their room and meet two new people or maybe three and talk to them because at because at the end of the day, even they are humans, like even though they may look like very professional, very stern, deep inside of them, they are humans. They have been in our seat before as well. Like, I mean, they were trainees as well after the, before they became partners. So deep down, even they are humans as well. So as Lucy and Daniel, so like try to have a banter, like a joke, like if it's appropriate, but yeah. And also just at the point at the bottom, which um, we haven't spoken about yet, but when you uh, you, know, when, you know when they say have you got any questions for us this is actually a really important part of the interview which I think a lot of people undermine but this can make or break your interview um, and the one thing that I would say is if you have you know if you if you're interested in some of their practice areas don't just have questions about that practice area pre-prepared because you probably won't get a partner from that practice area so um, I had questions prepared from every major practice area because I knew that at least one of the two partners would be from like one of the big practice areas. So, um, you know, I had a corporate partner in front of me and I knew that specifically with the multi specialism approach, they don't have like a public m &A team, a private equity team, joint venture team. They just kind of have the corporate team. So I asked him about that and how that worked specifically to do those teams. And then obviously I asked the finance partner, as I said earlier, about the, the Sonia transition. So um, amongst other questions, but you just don't want to go, hi, I love your real estate team. You know, I love this deal that you did. Can you tell me more about this deal to like a competition partner who like has no idea because he didn't work on that deal. Like he may have heard of it, he may have read of it, but like he, he can't answer that question. And it also shows that he's not really thought about who you are asking the question to and again that's a key skill to have to know what to say to certain people um so I'd really recommend sort of just preparing quite a varied 
range of questions for each yeah. sort of uh, practice area to tailor but those questions. I was going to say like ask something you're you're genuinely interested in. Yeah, and yeah. Don't just ask it for the sake of it. So for me personally, I didn't actually ask any questions that were to do with like practice areas or anything like that because. I, I don't know I just didn't I, I don't know why I just didn't feel the need to but I asked like more personal questions like when have you faced a challenge in your career and like how have you overcome it or like for one of my interviews the person my interviewing me was slightly late because she was dropping her kids off at school and she like apologized when she came to get me so at the end of the interview I was like oh how are you finding like balancing your family life um, and your work life because she was a director at a magic circle firm and I was like that's intense like, so we had like a little chat like woman to woman about like like that kind of thing it's like that question is like the last impression they will have of you so like make it a good one and like make sure you genuinely want to know the answer and what you've done there is really good and it's just highlighted that you've like sort of seen things in the day you've really listened to them you've seen where they've come from you've you've, li you've not just heard it but you've actually taken it in absorbed it and then you were able to ask a really personalized question based on that sort of experience that you'd had with them because you couldn't just ask that to any woman because a woman may not have a family you know yeah. so the fact that you've listened to that you've digested it and asked a really personalized question is exactly the point you need to you know everybody needs to start doing I think so, Ayanta, you can also ask questions like uh, regarding, for example, more specific towards the firm. For example, Slaughter is like, they have something called the Best Friends Network. So um, one of the things which I was quite interested in was like, how does actually the Best Friend Network like work? Because most of them, like, my, because most of like the MC firms, they have like international offices in various countries. Whereas I asked them, I mean, um, I as a partner, so like, what if let's say one of your best friend networks, like you know, like dropped out, and then they, I mean, and then and then they establish their own English, um, sorry, English branch in the UK, and so tailoring those kind of questions toward the firms, like, and something which you're very interested into, also shows that you are aware of what the firms like, like, I mean, also shows that you are interested in the firm, but also shows that you are also aware of the how the firm functions, like best friends network or or um, non billable hours so asking those specific questions show that you are well versed with the firm